So why don't we move on to uh, talk a little bit about trauma, and I'll have to warn you, my notes say that this, this lecture needs to be better organized, so uh, I haven't had a chance to do that yet, so but we'll at least see some cases here that might be interesting. So we've talked already about degenerative disease, inflammatory disease, now we talk about trauma, and then in a, uh, later we'll talk about congenital and de developmental variations. So, uh, let's see, uh, who did the last one? I did. Okay, Thomas, why don't you take this one? 31 year old male with okay. sports injury. Sports injury two hours before MRI. Uh, so, I guess this is the chest wall. So, at the ribs, there's some edema adjacent to the lower rib. Sort of soft tissue edema there too, and yeah, there's still edema there on the fluid sensitive sequence. Right. So yeah, it's just like the rib fracture. And then here we go. Uh, Let's here. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the rib was okay, but I think that's a very good thought. What is most common in, in these sports injury type traumas are intercostal muscle tears or obliquus tears are even more common than that. Um, this is pretty common. I, I would probably see seven or eight of these during the season for uh, for the Angels with Major League Baseball. Uh, so they, they certainly can happen. Uh, and uh, MR is really the best way to evaluate these. MR is not MR is okay, but not fantastic for rib fractures because I've seen some examples where you just don't have much edema about, around a rib fracture, uh, but. Uh, and it's hard to see the actual fracture itself because they're usually not displaced. Uh, <clears throat> and then when you get to the cartilage here, uh, you know, you get a lot of funny signal intensity on an MR scan. Uh, but these, these uh, oblique tears and intercostal tears can be seen pretty nicely with MR. Uh, uh, athletic injury. Well, it's stretching. Uh, no, usually it's, it's usually in the act of playing, re reaching for a ball and twisting. Yeah, you see that. That cause. Uh, okay, so I think this one. There's loss of disc height uh, signal. There's focal protrusion at um, the L5S1 or L45, maybe. I don't think that's why you're showing us this, though. Yeah, I think this is the S1 here. Okay, 5S1. Back pain after strain injury. Um, well, there's a lot of edema in the soft tissues, inferiorly, like over the sacral, yeah, lumbar sacral region, yeah. Maybe there too, yeah. Oh, okay. If you look at the axle at that level, you can see here. Well, there's stretching injury there. Yeah, there's stretching injury. Well, there's strain injury of the right paraspinal musculature and... Yeah, on the right than on the left, we see the edema here. And this was a strain of the spiny erecti muscles. Sahar? Sahar? Okay, uh, I guess we lost Sahar. Shiv? Okay, 27 year old man, symptoms compatible with sciatic neuropathy following drug overdose and prolonged unwitnessed coma in supine position. Okay, so we have PD and axial uh, images here. And the arrow is pointing to, I believe, this is a thickened sort of edematous sciatic nerve. Um, okay, a larger field of view. And it looks like the purple arrow is showing the sciatic nerve, which may be a little more thick and hyper intense than on the other side. Okay, MIP 3D space T2, focal increased caliber and T2 signal in the sciatic nerve. Let's pull the inferior corner. Yeah, so it looks asymmetrically enlarged and thickened. Okay. 
Uh, so similar findings. So there's probably some sort of impingement or piriformis syndrome here, maybe. Well, this is probably, yeah, it it, it, it probably is a piriformis syndrome, though it's uh, uh, probably due to prolonged stretching and a <clears throat> or compression, not from the piriformis muscle. It, from being supine. From being supine, and and these are uh, these aren't the uh, Jenny Bernardino, I believe, was uh, one of the authors in the recent paper that came out in Radiographics, which actually shows that a uh, much better sequence for evaluating this kind of condition are uh, diffusion images, especially diffusion tensor imaging, uh, which can actually see abnormal uh, diffusion of water on the different axes within a nerve. But uh, but this uh, uh, this is uh, one thing that certainly nerves can be damaged and a lot of people are, are really trying to look at ways for MR can evaluate that. I think these old techniques were, were somewhat difficult but I think there are newer techniques that are being developed which will make MR much, uh, a much much better tool for evaluating nerve injuries. And maybe None of those images were diffusion images? None of those were. None of those were. I, uh, there's, and I think it's this month's issue of Radiographics. There's a very nice article uh, from their group and from some Europeans uh, showing how different imaging can be very nice. Okay. Uh, uh, Thomas, what do you think of this case? 58-year-old uh, female with lower back pain, uh, 10 years of medication, and history positive for lower back pain at the clinic. So uh, AP and lateral views. And this is density overlying the particles of the L4, L5, and L3 fuel bodies. He has multiple opacities. There's a CT. <laughs> CT. Yeah. Yes, it's densely calcified. Uh, structures sort of in the spinal canal. So, so extending through now this, pa this patient has had multiple steroid injections. Uh, um, so, so this might be some kind of a reaction to the. So this is the kind of the, the differential that they had. Dystrophic extradural intraspinal foramen calcifications in severe spinal stenosis, dystrophic extradural from the steroid injection, CPBD, tumoral calcinosis. So they did surgery, and this is the post-op findings. Right, so they did a what is laminectomy. And I just realized this is in the wrong section. Maybe this is the reason why I, why I said this was poorly organized. So this actually is not traumatic. Uh, this was actually uh, uh, infectious. This was, this was a parasite. Oh, geez. And, uh, and here are some uh, other papers talking about extra calcifications. In this particular case, uh, this was a parasitic infection. I don't think they were able to figure out exactly what the parasite was, but they could see his uh, histologic evidence of eggs. Uh, from a uh, chronic infection. So I'm going to put that in a different That was introduced category. by the needle? Like no, the no, no, it's from a systemic infection. Yeah. Uh, okay, here. Um, yeah, this okay, pain at lumbosacral junction after long flight. So these are T1 weighted images? I guess all of them, is that right? Or... No, the bottom right image is a T2. So, but the rest are... I think these are T1s and these are T2s. Too. Okay, gotcha. So, there's, there's some space-occupying process in the canal. Um, so, here's one contrast. The okay. So... This, these could be METs, first of all. Um, it could be. So, 
the drop mats. Are these are these uh, vascular malformations and maybe like thrombosed, thrombosed vascular malformations? Actually, when we first did thoracic MRI imaging in the eighties, but with the techniques we had at that time, we saw all these full voids, and we thought maybe when we first saw it, they were missing a lot of common vascular malformations in the thoracic spine. They all turned out to be flow voids from CSF normal CSF postural flow. Uh, but uh, but uh, this would be a big vascular malformation to be asymptomatic. And we see all this abnormal signal intensity. Funny signal, this looks a lot like blood, right? Mm -hmm. And then we can also see a lot of uh, different signal here. This also looks a lot like blood. <clears throat> and this was a spontaneous subdural hem hematoma that had developed. <clears throat> so uh, for spinal hematomas, as you know, there are four types, epidural, subdural, subarachnoid, and intramedullary. And this just shows the spaces involved uh, with, with the, the different ones. And you have the, the different layers that you're all familiar about from medical school. And uh, subdural hematomas, you'll often get this kind of a triangular appearance uh, where the blood compresses the... Uh, the thecal sac, and you end up with this uh, trefoil type, type appearance. Uh, <clears throat> here's just kind of an example of a subdural hematoma there. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, uh, see, Sahar, what do you think of this case? Uh, so see, we, we have a high signal here, which looks like it's compressing the thick sac. So it looks like it's outside <coughs> the thick sac. If we, uh, but this this was a subdural hematoma, and you can see it extends up and down the spine, which is uh, pretty characteristic of a subdural hematoma. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, the axial plane can be very helpful to look at this. Uh, Shiv, what do you think of this case, a different case? A 55-year-old woman, both leg, posterior aspect, radiating pain. So this looks a lot like the cartoon you just showed with a sort of a Mercedes-Benz sign. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of, the Mercedes-Benz sign. It looks like an art, uh, a valve, actually, like a uh, aortic valve. Aortic something. valve in the wrong spot. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, subdural hematoma. So this is a classic chronic subdural hematoma. Hey, Thomas, what do you think of this case? Uh, chronic back pain, status post multiple epidural injections, and looks like there's a collection surrounding the triple sac. Hyper intense. Some things are coming down here. But here it looks like they're, we usually don't see the coverings like this because they're up against the, the wall. So now there's a collection surrounding it. And if we follow it down yeah, the levels, here, this is a T1 here. And we can see the funny kind of appearance of the, of the wood collection. And this was, this is really, uh, an epidural collection in this case, but this is the chronic epidural hematoma, and the, most of the blood products have been resorbed here, so it looks like a fluid on the uh, image. This was iatrogenic from multiple epidural injections. On the first sagittal image, can you see that, or is it... Over here? Yeah. Yeah. Would you call that, or I mean, to me, it just looks like normal CSF. It, on the, on the, sagittals, the sagittals, I wouldn't call it. Right. 
Those the axials look abnormal. Right here. On the axial, this is this is abnormal. But okay. something epidural here, because uh, the dura, we can see the dura. Normally, you can't see the dura. But something in the epidural space here, which allows us to see uh, the, uh, the the dura. See, the subdural space would be in here. But we have something out here is in the epidural space. So this all this anatomy is now visualized because the epidural collection is pushed it away from the bone, and uh, and we can see it. And that's why it has this appearance right here. So, Got it. so you can see the the entire thecal. There's this fluid is surrounding the entire thecal sac here. Okay. So now, looking at acute uh, uh, spinal injuries, uh, there there is a classification system. I won't go through this in great detail because, uh, uh, you know, certainly in our imaging, outpatient imaging, we, we don't see this a lot. Uh, even when I worked in the hospital, we didn't typically degrade these. But like everything else here, there has been a classification system to classify uh, acute spine injuries. <laughs> And if uh, so, typically what we look for are is, is whether which uh, segment of the spine the abnormality is. So this would be the anterior segment up here. This is the posterior segment back here. So the posterior segment would be the spinous process, the interspinous ligament, uh, and the the facet joints. The the anterior process would be basically the anterior longitudinal ligament, the discs and the vertebral bodies and the posterior longitudinal ligament. Some people also talk about a middle segment, which is really the, the, the pedicles. But, uh, and uh, they get come in injured because, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the spine has to support a, a lot of weight. And typically what happens is the weight of the body tends to want to pull the spine forward. So you've got a lot of extensor forces on, on the posterior elements here. So if you have trauma, especially if it has forced flexions, then you can get tears and fractures of the posterior elements. Then you can get compressions of the anterior, and then obviously displacement and rotation injuries. So uh, the type one kind of thing that you can get is a compression fracture. You're all familiar with them, so I don't think we... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, just a typical one is that most of the elements look intact, but we can just see that there is <laughs> impaction of the superior and inferior end plates. This is typically what we see in older individuals with osteoporosis, uh, the compression type fracture. Now you can get, if you have more of a normal bone with acute load on it, you can get a burst fracture where uh, instead of uh, the end plates just being compressed inwards, we, we basically have a bag of bones here. Uh, due to the complex fracture of the vertebral body itself. This obviously has a worse prognosis than the first one because this one may have unstable fragments. And you have to look and make sure those fragments aren't affecting any of the neural structures. Then you can have translation and rotation injuries, as we see here. And, and then distraction injuries uh, tend to have uh, interruption of the posterior elements like we were just talking about and kind of oblique fractures uh, through the vertebral bodies and discs. So that's more of a distraction type uh, or forward flexion type injury. Uh, and, uh, you know, posteriorly, you, you've got the, the facet joints and the capsules. You've got the interspinous ligament. Uh, <clears throat> so all these you really have to look at when, you, when you're looking at trauma of the spine. <clears throat> and what... Uh, <clears throat> What you really need, do need to uh, talk about in the report <clears throat> is what you think is happening with the neural structures. So you really need to look at the uh, roots and to see whether they're injured or not, the cord, either an incomplete or complete injury, and then the cauda equina. Uh, be sure and, and comment on those. And then uh, you can add up injuries to those, and uh, which can help determine whether you have a surgical condition or not. But again... Uh, this isn't something that I, I typically do, but if you work with neurosurgeons and you're in a setting where you see a lot of trauma, trauma, they may have a grading system that they would like you to follow uh, to help them with neurosurgical decision making. And if you need it, there's a checklist here that they recommend going through to make sure you don't miss anything 
when you're evaluating trauma of the spine. Okay, uh, who did the last one? Anybody remember? I don't know. Thomas, why don't you take this one? Yeah, so we've got a sagittal view of the thoracal lumbar spine. So there's compression of the T11 root heel body, diffuse edema. So this yeah, so it's typical compression fraction. You can see that the mechanism up here is probably kind of forward flexion and compression. Uh, you have to check to make sure the posterior elements are intact. Most of the time in this kind of injury they are, but you have to check to make sure this, especially if there's acute trauma involved, a lot of these are your trauma uh, and people who are osteoporotic with degenerative spines like, like we're seeing in this case. If it's involved in an auto accident, this can be near where the seatbelt is, and a lot of people will call those chance fractures, right, right in this particular area. And for those, you just have to make sure that there's there, you don't have fractures of the posterior elements, which would make it an unstable type fracture. And here's a, another uh, similar kind of fracture. This one in a less uh, degenerative type spine than a more young person. This was an acute injury. In this particular patient, we can see the fracture line, the compression of the vertebral bodies, but again, it looks like a stable lesion. Uh, <clears throat> we don't see a mass. When you see blowing of the posterior cortex like this, you have to be concerned about possible metastatic disease, but we see no mass within the vertebral body, and the disc looks like they're normally maintained. So that was a, an acute compression fracture in a young person. Okay. Second. Severe compression deformity of... Um... L1, I guess. Um, I mean, there's there's a horizontal chance type component, but it looks like just uh, compression, yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay. Some and soft tissue with the image. Yeah. Um, the other hematoma or. Yeah. Or so we would want to check out, see see what that is, and this is also this was a follow up study uh, a year and a half later. No, no, this is a previous study, yeah. sorry about that, uh, before the fracture, and you can see the change of morphology due to the, to the fracture. And that was a acute compression fracture, then there was a hematoma, just like you said, uh, lateral to it. Okay. Sahara, what do you think of this patient? <clears throat> August 2007, uh, is that you have anthropic specific L5 S1, and it's a So we have small little pieces. We have probably a vacuum phenomenon with the disc, a lot of different a bit of big spondylolisthesis. So we have to uh, be concerned uh, about that. Okay. So uh, and then this is just uh, as what I want you to concentrate on. However, here is the L4 vertebral body. This is on August 27. The patient came in here looking for back pain, and the patient has spondylolisthesis. Uh, in this case, I think it's due to severe, I believe it's due to severe degenerative uh, disease, facet disease. But then about a week after the MR scan, the patient developed increasing symptoms. So after trying to treat it conservatively, she came back in a month later uh, for another MR scan, and this is what it showed. And we have some uh, edema here in it. So this is an acute <coughs> compression fracture. And typically the way we tell the difference, if it's really acute, you'll see edema, maybe even hemorrhage in, in the uh, fracture site itself. If it's subacute, we may see some kind of <coughs> diffuse loss of the fat signal. Uh, but we, with uh, subacute, we tend not to see focal fluid collections. And in the chronic, you'll just see deformity with uh, fat replacement of the marrow space. Okay, uh, Shiv. <clears throat> okay, 72 year old, right thigh pain and weakness immediately following kyphoplasty. So it looks like uh, it's the, one of the lumbar. Vertebral bodies looks like it was uh, fractured, and they did a it's probably T12. Oh, sorry, yeah, T12. And it looks like they tried repairing it, 
uh, with the um, forgetting the name of the material they use, um, cement extrusion, right? Cement, and it looks like it went posteriorly into the exactly. spinal canal there. So what's happened here is they've had a cement extrusion come out and compressing the conus. Hey, Thomas. A uh, 82 year old male root impingement. So it's a uh, post operative. Looks like the laminectomy L3, L4, and L5 level. And uh, fusion. There's some osseous interbody fusion. And the, I guess the nerve roots are displaced posteriorly. And uh, yeah, there's some significant stenosis. Here's a, another sagittal image here where we can see uh, <clears throat> there's a, a little fracture line here. We can see the extrusion here and some central stenosis. Hmm. Again, this is typically occurs above the level of a multi-level uh, fusion that uh, almost invariably, if you fuse this much spine, you're going to get, the patient's going to come back with pathology at the level of above, above it due to all the stresses and strains that are, that are placed on the, the level above it. That's why people are trying to look at other options. But certainly in the, in the lumbar spine, the artificial discs have not worked out very well. And I think they're very questionable from my experience in the cervical spine as well. But uh, that's uh, one of the major complications, as we've already talked about, of doing spinal fusions. Okay, and then uh, here we can see a fracture just in the upper part of the line, uh, 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 upper part of the image in the lower thoracic spine, a horizontal fracture extending back into the posterior elements. We see a lot of hemorrhage along the way. Uh, compression of the conus, and this is a typical chance fracture. This was someone who was in an automobile accident with the old kind of seat belts before they had the shoulder straps. Okay. <clears throat> we will evaluate abnormal chest x-ray findings. Okay. This looks pretty good, I think. Um. Some density in the hilum, I guess. Thermoplasty. Oh, yeah. This is, this is um, this got into a vein. I think it it um, embolized, right? So that's another complication you can have from thermoplasty. You can actually embolize see it in the vascular system. Okay, <laughs> so hard. <laughs> We have acute, uh, kind of a commuted fracture of L3 vertebral bodies, protruding into the cord, and um, the, what about the cord? You have the nerve roots there, and the compression of the nerve roots there. Yeah. So here we have multiple fragments. This looks kind of a first fracture almost of the L3 vertebral body. It also looks like it's abnormal sugar, but we can do with this. Very concerned about it being unstable all the axial images we can see the posterior ele elements are also involved going back through here which makes it an unstable fracture uh, this patient also had a dural tear and significant injuries to the nerve roots on the one side okay uh chef okay 47 year old man so it looks like this is a post-op spine and there's a large um fluid collections are adjacent to the uh, hardware and the posterior elements. Yeah, it looks like a post up tear, drill tear. Thomas, are you with us? 
Oh yeah, uh, 45 mil mil fall down from six meters in drunken event. Uh, so, so I guess this would qualify as a chance factor. Yeah. Compression into first year elements. Yeah, and uh, first year elements are involved here. Here's the MR scan. Yeah, there's a compression of the anterior vertebral body and then yeah. and just more of a distractive yeah. posteriorly. And significant uh, compression here involving the neural structures with no CSF around the nerves. More than five patients went to surgery. And here's the post op appearance. Again, we already talked about you can do scoring here. Okay. Uh, Sam. <coughs> Severe compression deformity of that uh, lower thoracic bone. Um, and it's, uh, it's compressing on that, uh, on the cord. Blood uh, edema. This patient has severe osteoporosis, and this is what uh, has a compression component. Uh, this just uh, to remind me, <clears throat> uh, this is clearly the osteoporotic fracture. If you look at it, uh, you look at this, this, there's concern whether this could be a mass in this location. This was. Clearly, in this case, we we see no marrow replacement here. We see nice, normal uh, posterior contour of the cortex, and then we see spondylolisthesis and compression here. There's a com concern here about whether or not this could be a metastatic lesion. And uh, we look here; it really doesn't look like a mass, and looks very similar edema to the other areas. And that with those were just osteoporotic fractures. You know, the, and the things to look for to try to differentiate between osteoporosis and metastatic disease is in metastatic disease, almost always, you'll, you'll get a convex posterior uh, cortex of the vertebral body. This one is still straight. Uh, the image inflates, uh, posterior elements are typically weird uh, and osteoporotic fractures. No soft tissue mass. <coughs> No restricted diffusion, which we don't have here. Uh, and uh, the studies have really shown that contrast enhancement is not helpful in differentiating traumatic injuries from metastatic disease. <coughs> Both can enhance <coughs> and in the, excuse me, the same configuration. <coughs> yep. If it involves the vertebral body, what you get is slow destruction of the of the trabecular bone that, that typically leads to uh, <coughs> pressure uh, forcing the, uh, the end plates together. This causes posterior bowing of the, of the cortex, and so you'll get a posterior bowing of the cortex. This is concave and, uh, uh, with metastatic disease. You'll almost always get a convex kind of. And that's very characteristic, and it's one of the best signs. So, uh, uh, you see a com uh, compression fracture secondary to metastatic disease, you look for a soft tissue mass, it's just the opposite of what I just said. Uh, uh, you see, they typically, the metastatic disease starts in the pedicles and extends to the rest of the vertebral body. Often, there are multiple uh, levels involved. Uh, and some of the other levels, you may have earlier involvement and see that it's primarily in the area of the pedicle. That's where the small vessels are. That's where mats tend to first grow from. Uh, you don't see any intervertebral fluid. Uh, and no, no edema, so forth. Okay, uh, let's see, who did the last one? Sam. Sam, okay. Sahar, what do you think of this one? Uh, we have a compression fracture of the upper vertebral body on the side of the 
he looks like. You know the name of this? There's a name given for this. It's called Kumos disease. And there are some papers to say that if you have gas within it, then it's it's definitely not a metastatic lesion. And uh, that's just what some, some papers will say. It's, some people call it uh, post-traumatic osteonecrosis. I, I don't think... And I'm not sure that it's <clears throat> true. I think these are, this, this is what I was thought back when I was first described in 1891. <clears throat> these are typically seen in uh, osteoporotic ind individuals. <clears throat> exactly where the gas comes from, I think people are kind of up in the air. But, uh, but this is a recognized phenomenon. And that the gas, most of the literature shows, is, uh, uh, means that it's not a malignant process. Okay, Shiv. Okay, history of back pain extending into both legs increased after chiropractic injury. So it looks like um, the lower lumbar neural foramen uh, looks pretty narrow, and it looks like the exiting nerve root is uh, being compressed. Um, the question is why? I think it's, it could be degenerative versus... I don't. Is that a fracture or is that the pars maybe? The pars. The accident. Okay. So it looks like a. Is that where the pars be? Is that a pars or a posterior element fracture? Or? It's actually a fracture. There are actually fractures on both sides. Hmm. So this was uh, basically pars from actually acute fracture. Okay, uh, Thomas. So there is a irregularity at the anterior superior vertebral body. Uh, I don't see any edema. So right, it's kind of remote injury. Yeah, this probably occur in kids when you still have the ring apophysis in case in place and. This is really thought to be herniation of this material into the ring apothesis. <laughs> but in the textbooks, it's called a uh, congenital variation, and it's called a limbus vertebra. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> thought, to, thought to be uh, a congenital variant. But with MR, we see that the disc is almost always abnormal at this level, and so it's probably remote trauma from childhood. Uh, with disc extending in here, which doesn't allow the ring apophysis to normally fuse with the vertebral Okay, Jeff. There's some retrolisthesis of L4 on 5 and some disc extrusion probably there. Yeah, um, Is that real edema in the interspinous? Yeah. So what's happening there? So, and if you get the axial images, it's right in there. They could have been a posterior distraction, kind of like a flexion injury. Yeah, so the The disc herniation. Here's another example of a interspinous ligament tear, in this case having fluid, which is going and compress compressing the nerve root there. Now here's just another example with a big cyst coming from the interspinous ligament tear. Again, compressing the thecal sac. <laughs> okay, Sahar. Yeah, right there. And this is the same thing. It looks like there's a fracture on the right side. 
That's right near the Fisetuan. Yeah. Yeah. Here, the Fisetuans look like they're probably intact, but we see intense edema, uh, really, in the paraspinous muscles there. And here's the post contrast. Okay, you can see the enhancement on those muscles, those random muscles. So what do you think it is? It's a little bit fracture. Well, I think the bones are okay. But this is this is the interspinous ligament. Yeah. It's brains and the interspinous muscles. So, uh, the back pain, I don't, I can't explain the fever or the headache. Uh, maybe the patient felt a little bit of, of <clears throat> inflammatory reaction from the muscle tears, or the likely the fever and headache might have been not related. Uh, uh, CT spine showed no fractures, and all this abnormality was really. Uh, I think the thing you'd have to be concerned about is whether this patient could have an infection, uh, but the history was really more one of trauma. So this this was actually a acute tear uh, of the paraspinous muscles and the interspinous ligament. Okay, Shiv? Okay, 68-year-old <clears throat> woman with tender posterior mass. So we have a stir and a T1 fat sat post. So on the stir, it looks like there's fluid in the in between the inner spinous, um, the, yeah, right, over, right through there, extending sort of to the soft tissues, and it looks like the uh, T1 FS post. I don't know if that's enhancement or if that's blood, maybe, but it looks like degeneration and Bastrop's disease. So it's a case of Bastrop's disease. Why is it hyper intense on the T1 post? Is it granulation tissue or something? Granulation or? Tissue. Right, it's granulation tissue. Okay. And then you can see this is another case where there's a uptake on the bone scan. On the MR scan, we can see the typical degenerative changes of Bastrop's disease here on the T1 and STIR sequence. And again, with a lot of the uh, thickening of the soft tissues due to the inflammatory reaction from the repetitive trauma around it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thomas, what do you think of this? So you have uh, sagittal views on the left and the right, and there's a prominent osteophyte at L5S1, some fluid at the facet joint at L4, L5, and some soft tissue edema yeah, overlying the spinous process. Yeah, it's really in the and, spinous muscles there. And <clears throat> these were tears of the uh, spiny erectile muscle. This is muscle. Yeah, well, why don't we stop here and we'll finish the, the trauma section uh, on Thursday. Okay. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.